have things to say. Oh, Kate, Tamara, Jessie, where are you? There you are. Lady here, Kate, and then Jessie, you take the lady there. So we'll start with these two. We'll take both questions first and then we'll answer. Hi, I'm Kate Fallon, uh, here today as chair of the Special Education Consortium. An amazing amount of information we've just heard there. Um, and I suppose I really am thinking about, you seem to have a lot of information coming in, a lot of intelligence from uh, both health and education. And then we saw the figures on parental confidence. And we know that a lot of this work came out of issues doing parental confidence in the beginning. What I wanted to know is, is there any able to triangulate some of this information? So you've got the good stuff that's coming in from education, the good stuff that's coming in from health. Is that matching where parental confidence is showing? And are there then key features you can see from that that actually can help with the learning process in the future? Okay, so thanks, it's one thanks Kate. Lady here, do you want to give us your question as well? And then we'll come back to the panel. Yeah, I'm Louisa Waters, Head of Children's Therapy Services for Midway Community Healthcare. And it was really more of a point of comment rather than necessarily a question, um, but it was a comment really to Stuart around the um, health provision um, for, um, and the health um, using reasonable endeavours to provide the information. And I just wanted to share with you something that we were doing in our area. So we have one of our KPIs on our service is that we have to provide all information for the EHCP within six weeks, and I have to provide data on that on a, um, on a quarterly basis. But my concern is that in doing that, because there is no additional funding within the system, that that actually... Um, means that I have to rationalise resources for provision of support to other children whilst we're writing those, um, that advice, and that is quite a timely and costly service. And it was really if you had any thoughts around how we rationalise the resources to provide information in a timely manner whilst not um, depriving children of the therapy and the intervention that they need. Okay, thank you very much. Who would like to answer? Uh, is this working? Yes, great. I'll start. Um, Kate, so thanks for your question. Um, on, on parental confidence, what, what we do now with our local authority survey is basically ask almost exactly the same questions of parent care forums. So that is entirely matchable. And as I was saying when I was speaking, um, quite a lot of uh, parent care forums and local authorities actually talk to one another when they're filling these forms in, which is re a really good thing actually, because it, if there are different levels, of, if there are different perceptions in a, a local area about how things are going, that sort of helps to drive those out. Um, the one thing I would say consistently is that the local authorities tend to paint a slightly rosier picture than the uh, parents and um, you know that's probably not surprising and you know as I was saying the, the level of confidence in meeting that 2018 deadline is, is a, you know, a clear one there where I think I said you know roughly about 20 local authorities aren't sure they're going to manage it and Parent care forums, if you ask them, they say words about 35 local authorities actually. So um, it's a helpful thing, and you know, yeah, so, but so yes is the answer to your question. We do try to sort of match up that uh, data too. I don't know if Lorraine wants to add anything, but I'll just talk to the lady here from, from Medway first. So um, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, so I, don't, I don't think it's the sort of you know, DFE official national lead, if you like, on SEND. Disability, it's for me to try to prescribe to you how to um, undertake that balancing act that you describe because that's got to be down to your judgment and your sort of professional judgment in those circumstances. So obviously, I can take the point, and I'm sure Lorraine takes the point about there not being unlimited resources and you're needing to uh, to perform that sort of balancing act. It's the sort of balancing act Christine was talking about at the beginning around. Uh, timeliness of EHC plans more generally and the quality of EHC plans of course we all want to see high quality we also want to see them delivered on time but we have to recognise that, that individual people working in individual areas are going to be making these kind of difficult trade-offs um, all of the time within a system which has a finite level of resource so um, I recognise it's not straightforward Lorraine, do you want to add anything? And then I'll come to a couple more questions. Is this actually working? Yeah, it's working. Okay. So, <laughs> um, yeah, especially if I'm a bit short, you wouldn't <laughs> see me. Um, so, uh, Kate, you mentioned about how you, you triangulate some of that evidence and data. 
I mean, that's part of our data and evidence subgroup and also our assurance subgroup. So we have other partners around the table. It's not just about looking at health staff. So we have the uh, National Network Pay and Care Forum and steering group members. We have DFE. Um, uh, you know, it, it's about picking out well, what, what, what's going on in that area and sometimes doing a little bit of a deep dive. Um, there is a nervousness around sharing some of the data, as you can imagine. But at the end of the day, if, if the local areas can start to share and discuss, that starts the conversation. So I, th I find that that's more important when they start to get together. What's sad in the system is when you get that, when it gets to the inspection stage, and then you see the differences. Mm -hmm. it, we should know about that before. Um, and that's all about building those relationships and confidence within people, being able to approach that conversation. Um, and how you sort of, you know, truly, are we co-production or are we just sort of, you know, ticket item and say, well, actually, we just have parents in the room, but actually they don't have a voice. That's, that's not good enough. So I, th I think there's, a, uh, there's definitely work to do. Um, in terms of the community health services, I absolutely get it. And it's probably my fault that I put it in the contract, so you can blame me. Um, but the, the important thing here was that health um, didn't really understand their duties, and the only way that we could use a contract lever, and it's not the only, the only way that happens, but if we have that, it can start the conversation. So if you're saying, well, actually, I, you know, these, that takes time. Six weeks is a very short turnaround, and I know from doing safeguarding work in the past and community nurse, things take time, reports take time, um, but it's about you then being able to have that conversation with the commissioners and saying, well, actually, do you know what? We've mapped this out. We need a bit more resource to be able to get to that timeline of the end of March 2018. Um, so it's, it, it's there as an enabler, um, but it's also a challenge to the system. Um, I appreciate that. And it's not really just about the timeliness, because actually what you want is, yes, the time to be right, but you want a really good education, health and care plan that actually is going to meet those outcomes. Um, and I think we've got a long way to go on them too. And it's great to see the, the, health, the advice and the um, booklet that's come out um, today in your packs. Really important piece of work. We've got lots to do in health. Um, what I found is that in terms of uh, Q&A, really important. To stop the rain because she's very, very passionate about what she does. <laughs> I want to take a couple more questions before we break. I can see the front have got lots of questions. The back of the room, are you not hearing it or not interested, or are you all completely <laughs> content with the way that we're going? And so you have no questions at all. Just check in before I come back to people at the front. Okay, they're all very happy at the back of the room, Matthew, because they can't see the television. Okay. There are two questions at the front. Lady here, please, first, and then you second, sir. Um, Lynette Woodward, um, from one of the Sendias services. Um, a question for Stuart, really. Um, you said that um, there's some of the lo local authorities aren't confident about hitting the 2018 deadline. Um, we're from one of them, absolutely. <laughs> um, we're a long way off. Um, What's going to happen to those local authorities that are unlikely to meet the deadline? Okay, thank you. Whilst you contemplate, let's have the next question. I'm being waved at our lady there. Hello, my name is Susan Doherty. I'm from Compton Warwickshire Partnership Trust, um, and also send lead and therapy manager. Um, my question is, where is the health funding? We have not had one penny, and yet since the 1st of July we have had a thousand requests for advice for an EHC plan. It has come to the point that we are doing nothing but in some of our services. And, we, and we've done that, we've reduced budgets, not increased budgets. So we've seen today huge investment into local authority. This was already a requirement of a local authority. So what is happening about health funding across this country? Because we're not alone. Okay, while Lorraine contemplates that, I'll take the last question before tea break and workshops. Hello, I'm Peter Lee from one of the uh, independent support services, um, uh, also from a local authority that doesn't uh, think it's going to meet its um, April the 2018 deadline. So my question partly relates to that, but also in terms of uh, what support 
do you see will be available going forwards for families beyond the April 2018 deadline? Will there be things like independent support, particularly in the, in the local authorities where they maybe don't meet the deadline? Okay, lovely. Thank you. All right. Stuart, do you want to go first? Yeah, okay. So I'll take uh, the first and third of those. So um, what happens if you don't make it? Um, well, so we obviously want you to do it. And we're going to be putting quite a lot of pressure on uh, during the course of this year, though we don't want people to compromise on quality. We want both quality and timeliness and everything done on time. I recognise we want a lot. Um, I, I guess I guess we'll have to see when we get there, to some extent. But um, if you think about the experience of uh, looking back to what I was saying earlier about LDAs, so. We, it's an imperfect system and we've been driving a few out of the woodwork, I think, but what we are basically doing is putting quite a lot of pressure on those local authorities um, to get it done while at the same time making sure that children and young people are not adversely affected. I think we would probably pursue a similar uh, kind of uh, route on, on the HCB as well, so pressure to get it done because I don't think anybody wants this really to, to drag on. Like we want to be into the post uh, March 18 world, we want to be into that, you know, there's one underpinning uh, legal system and we want to be able to get on with the sort of, you know, really engendering that, that culture of, um, of support that we want to see in place focused on you know, needs and aspirations and so on. In a, in a sense, we want to get beyond this hump of having to get these transitions done, so expect pressure, I think, to get it done uh, and, and support uh, for, for pressure, mostly. Um, IS, uh, what happens to IS beyond this year? That's a really good question because um, when the independent supported programme was conceptualised, it was conceptualised as something to support transition, and something to support families and uh, children and young people going through the transition. Um, it's been very successful and very popular um, and, you know, we get the sort of, you know, the, the I haven't got figures off the top of my head, but the, the data and the feedback and the stats that we get uh, from, from people who've used the system are all extremely uh, positive. So we're doing a wide, as I said right at the end of my presentation, we're doing a wider piece of work now on what does 18, 19 and beyond look like. And it's one of the live questions that we have to consider is what support should there be in local areas for um, children, young people and families. I mean, so we have to think about um, I think we have to think about this, the local system as a whole, so we have to think about independent supporters, we have to think about uh, independent advice and support services, we need to think about the role of parent care forums and how all of that should fit together in the sort of post-transition world. So it's a sort of live set of issues for us, um, so I haven't got a, a pat answer, but it is something we're thinking uh, quite closely. What I'm, what I'm not going to do is say, yes, we'll carry on with IS beyond 18, into 1819, but something we're, we're thinking closely about. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, very good question. Um, in terms of health funding, I think that's how you should escalate that conversation up to the Children's Commissioners, but also have that conversation with your DCO or DMO, because they'll be the ones that will to influence the CCG board. And also link up with our NHS England lead, um, because the more you join up the evidence, put it together, get people to realise, hey, we've got a problem here, where are we going to get this workforce from? Particularly in therapies, really, you know, that, that you know, we're not we haven't got the workforce right anyway to deliver some of the services. Some of the specifications are out of date across health children's um, care. So it's about having that local conversation. If I can help in any way to have that, please let me know. Well, it needs okay. to go up the line further. Talk to Lorraine when you're having a cup of tea. <laughs> okay, Matthew tells me we've got room for a couple more questions. The back of the room, this is your last chance. <laughs> no, all right, well, okay, there's a lady right at the back, and then there are a couple of people. Uh, Tamara, if you can take the lady right at the back, and Jessie, if you can come round, and there is a lady with a green jumper, maybe. And then a lady at the front here. And we will take the three questions before we have answered. If you could tell us who you are and make your questions short, I would be grateful. Lady, let's start at the back. Lady at the back, you want to start first? Yeah, hi there. It's Jacqueline Lee, the Head of Children, Young People and Maternity Commissioning. 
and that's the London Borough of Bexley and I work for the Bexley Clinical Commissioning Group. It's great to see, it's great to see today um, NHSE and DFE strategically in a room together. However, you know, it's, that's very good that they're looking at the training opportunities that are coming up led by NHSE. It's a shame it's not multidisciplinary and educational professionals are nodding that meeting and attending that training. The biggest issue I have as a joint commissioner is disconnect in, in funding and how we fund placements. And to me, if I was sort of strategically planning, that would have been one of the first things I think I would have arranged subgroups around, having educational and health professionals. But I think it has to be led strategically by the NHSE and DFP, because at the moment we're trying to battle it out locally, but we need joint guidance from the top be instructing what we can be doing, you know. Locally. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Lady in the middle, do you want to give us a little My name's Marie Kester and I'm a parent. Um, I've got an older daughter, she's 24 now. Um, it took 16 months to complete her EHCP, which was then rejected twice. Um, on the grounds that because she's older, it's no longer education, she's not going to gain formal qualifications or go to work, so therefore, what's the point of an education and its social care? Um, you know, what, what is there for people in, in this age group? Because within the community, it's like, okay, well, are there any day centres you can go to? I mean, you know, she's young, she's, she wants to be involved in things. Um, also, in regards to um, support, I mean, I'm in London, but I have a friend in Somerset, that's South Somerset, North Somerset, and there is a lack of available, um, how can I say, voluntary sectors that can support parents and provide advocacy, um, independent advocacy that is, and independent support advice. Okay, um, we'll take the final question from the lady here, um, before we come back to the panel. Uh, Jessie, if you just have the mic. Lady here. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Tracy. I'm a parent, but I also do a lot of work with families and young people um, who have gone through the process of EHC CAD and are also waiting for them. Um, one of the biggest issues I'm finding is there is currently a lot of children and young people on SIM support or have mental or other needs. Um, regarding ADHD and stuff that um, are not getting the right strategies in school. There's a lot of them that are being excluded and they're just left with um, no kind of choices. They're at home, the parents are finding it a long, lengthy and convoluted process to try and get some help for these children and schools aren't being made accountable for what's happening with these children once they're out of school. Okay, thank you very much. Well, challenging set of questions for the panel before it gets a cup of tea. Who would like to start? Um, I'll start because I've, I've just now got my brain into gear a lot. Um, so we, the, the question around placements and having local discussions around funding is really important. Um, so only last week I started to have a conversation with NHS England and DH about the Who Pays guidance that came out in 2013. We need to make that right so that national guidance is clear to people out there trying to work through what that means. There will be like a case study type sort of um, scenario that will sit underneath that. So look out for that April sort of May time and hopefully um, that, that will help some of those discussions around funding and, and how things are should, should be joined up and who the response of the commissioner is. Um, and in terms of other things around experience of education, health and care plans. Stuart mentioned earlier about the large scale family survey. I've got that drilled down to CCG level so that I can have the conversations with the CCGs about what, what their families are going through and how they can make a, make a difference there. It does link into the work that's going on transforming care with the children and young people's pathway um, and the service model there. There are challenges with those uh, complex cases. Right, uh, I'll try and answer all of that, um, if I can. Um, uh, by the way, in case anyone's wondering, this, uh, on my right here, this is um, Becky Benwell, who works in uh, my unit, and she, she was held up this morning, so she uh, come, arrived part way through, but 
Um, if, 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 uh, if I struggle with any of these questions, Becky's going to step in and answer them brilliantly. Um, so on, on the joint commissioning uh, point, look, if, there, if there's specific NHS training going on that you think there should be a DfE input to, then let's talk about it. Tell me exactly what it is. I'll talk to Lorraine and we'll, we'll see if there's something that we can um, do about that. So that, you know, there's a very, should be a very practical solution to that. Um, and we, had, we had questions from two parents. So the, the, the first uh, lady, um, I'm, I'm, so firstly, I'm sorry to hear about the experience that you had and that it took so long and that you know, went through that, that, that the process of it being uh, rejected twice. Um, education, health and care plans uh, do, not do not have to be about formal qualifications and the outcomes do not have to be about formal qualifications. There's been an upper tier tribunal judgment which has said exactly that. Yeah, I, I would, it, Jane McConnell, somewhere in the room, will be a great person for you to talk to. Uh, from, uh, you, Jane used to be um, uh, work for Ipsy and is now a tribunal judge. And if there's anyone you want to talk to about the law, uh, Jane will be a brilliant person to, to do that. Um, the other, this is exactly the kind of territory that we want to get into. In uh, I was talking about a fact sheet around uh, sort of 19 to 25 so that we want to put out to make to clarify the law and to make sure people have got a clear understanding of the law and also part of that will be about I think we'll get start to get into a bit of the territory you were in about you know what is the provision locally because um, sometimes people struggle with uh, you know uh, it doesn't sound like this necessarily applies in your case but you know college is only offering three days a week or what about the other two days and education health and care plan should be about packages of support for children and young people um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, it's more it's difficult if the provision is not there, and you know, you can't sort of necessarily magic it up. But if the demand is there, you would hope that local areas would seek to you know meet the the demand that is there. But so so what's what's this space for our sort of nineteen to twenty five actually, which would say you know how it is. I would talk to Jane definitely about the law. Sounds like you know it already, but uh, do that. Um, the other parent was talking about SEN uh, support, uh, mental health and exclusions. Mm -hmm. Becky might uh, jump in here, but just to say, um, uh, SEN support, it, as I was saying in my presentation earlier, uh, it, was in, it was back in that white paper in, back in May that we said, you know, we want to take a close look at the experience and the outcomes that children and young people with SEN have in schools, and as I was saying, that ambition uh, remains. It's it's. I would, I would sort of characterise our focus over the last you know, five or six years probably has been on the statutory end of the system. It's been about education, health and care plans. It's been 2.8% it's of children and young people have uh, that, that level of complex SEN need. But there's another 12% who have, who have SEN support needs. And we really need to broaden our focus out and think about them too and think about the experiences they're having. Uh, in schools and thinking about how schools can support them and think about you know, how all the different policies that the department has in place for for all students, how they impact on children and young people that they see in their disability. And so that is what we are trying to do uh, at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I would hope there's going to be an insight soon because there's a lot of children out the school at the moment and their time can't wait. <coughs> No, 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 no,